All right, Islam, and welcome to more Tales of the History. This is Tennessee. And let's see. Thank you so much for joining us once again. This is like, I believe, the third Wednesday where we're going to read from um, a book that references who the real slave of the Moroccan American land are and is. Um, it is a necessary piece of information, necessary piece of information that has not been a part of what we were told and allegedly taught, um, but it is absolutely necessary in order for all of us to gain a clear and concise picture of how we got to this place. And it also puts experiencing today, um, which is, you know, absolutely uh, unconstitutional, absolutely amazing. And um, when you have the necessary information, you can put a lot of things in perspective. That is so necessary for your study, um, you know, when it comes to proclaiming your nationality. These things are necessary. Without them, you end up missing a lot. So what we have done in the last three, I think, or two readings, yes, two readings. This is the third. The format is, I'm going to read for about an hour. Yeah, let's see. It's uh, 7.45, and I'm going to read until 9 o'clock. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the line for discussion about what we learn in this reading. And, it, you know, I would be so... Um, you know, it would be so pleasing if we can, you know, as many people as possible participate. Because what I'm going to do is for everyone who wants to participate in the doc, in the discussion, you press one on your telephone back, and I'm going to unmute everyone. And we have a type of discussion, like as if we were sitting around a conference table. Um, reading and reviewing, as opposed to being all across the nation and possibly around the world participating in the discussion. So that is the format, and I am hoping and trusting that we will have um, people who would like to participate in the discussion because, like I said, we, we have to catch up on seriously missing information. And uh, because these institutions that are called schools are actually um, chartered, so to speak, or they come out of municipal corporations, they're not going to tell you the true history of how they were even started. So we must take it upon ourselves to do the next research to find the information so that we can get a clearer picture of exactly what happened on this continent, you know, as it relates to our relationship with modern Europeans. You must understand that when they talk about colonization by Britain, France, Russia, Many of us have been mentally conditioned to believe that the, the powers that dictate those corporate entities are not European. They are not. They are more. And they represent different branches of one family. All right? So last week I read out of a book, or I mean, I'm sorry, Last Wednesday and the Wednesday before, I read out of a book called Colonists for Sale by Clifford Lindsay Alderman. And that book, and it, and it, and it was, I 
movie. Let me see. I thought I saw. Let me see when this was first written. I thought I saw like a. a, a okay, it has. It was um, copyrighted in 1975. And, uh, yes. I read the, um, let's see, I read up to Chapter 6, I believe. Yes, uh, Chapter 6. But what I want to do this week is because I was reading, it was getting into you know, the plight of the modern Europeans on this Moroccan soil. But I remember reading another book that really, really went into great detail. And I thought it was this book that I started reading from, but it's not. It is actually another book that I believe was referenced by Abdullah Bey, um, and it is entitled White Cargo. The Forgotten History of Britain's White Slave in America. So I'm going to switch and start reading from that book. That book gets into naming names of the minds of people, why the modern Europeans were kidnapping fellow modern, their own family members and selling them into slavery, then slaves themselves, right? So before I get into reading that, just want to read an excerpt. There's so many books. Who knew they were out there, right? I want to read an excerpt from another book that um, is copyrighted. Looks like the first copyright was 1991. It's an excerpt out of this book, and that is entitled "They Were White and They Were Slaves: The Untold History of the of the Enslavement of Whites in Early America" by Michael A. Hoffman the Second. This is just to give you an idea of actually what was going on because, you know, the timeline of a lot of things that we have been told is so false and so out of whack. So I just want to read this excerpt for you to get an idea of why modern Europeans today will literally take out an entire nation to preserve themselves because this is where they're coming from. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that this is why they're doing it, because of where they come from. All right? So um, this is from page 50, and I don't think this book has chapter. Oh, I don't think it has chapter title. Oh, yes, it does. It's called page 15, and this is the Holocaust against the white poor. A Holocaust against, yes. It's entitled, it's, it's actually not really a chapter. It's called A Holocaust Against the White Poor. This is an excerpt, and it reads, Herman Melvin, in his autobiographical, autobiographical account of his first voyage as a slave, described the same living death in the English port city of Liverpool in 1839. Quote, I generally pass through a narrow street called Lancelot's Head. Once passing through this place, I heard a feeble wail. It seemed the low, hopeless, endless wail of someone forever lost. At last, I advanced to an opening. Two details of cellar beneath a crushing old warehouse. And there, some 15 feet below the wall, crouched a nameless squalor with her head bowed over with the figure of what had been, was a the figure of what had been a woman. Her blue arms folded over her livid bosom, two shrunken things like children that leaned toward her, one on either side. At first, I knew not whether they were alive or dead. They were dumb and mixed to dead with warmth. How they had crawled into that death, I could not tell. But there they had crawled to die. I tried to lift the woman's head, 
But feeble as she was, she seemed bent upon holding it down. Observing her eyes flashed upon her bosom, and that something seemed hidden under the rags there, a thought crossed my mind which compelled me forcibly to withdraw her hands for a moment when I caught glimpse of a meager little thing, the lower part of its body thrust into an old body. Its face was dazzling white, even in its squalor, but the closed eyes looked like balls of indigo. It must have been dead some hours. I stood looking down on them while my whole soul swelled within me, and I asked myself, what right had anybody in the wide world to smile and be glad when sights like this when were to be seen. Melvin Redburn, his first voyage, Anchor Book Edition, page 173 to 178. That's just an excerpt from this particular book, They Were White and They Were Slaves, which I do intend to read at a later date. It's a little bit more graphic. Um, so before I get into that, I want to first read White Cargo, because white cargo gives you such it, – it, it gives you really great background information into how many of the modern Europeans got to the position that they're in, where they came from, what their true story, what their true heritage is, and how it has been – literally erased, now, untold. And in some cases, it has been, their story has the, the people of their, of their story has been switched with the aboriginal indigenous people. So it's like the story is the same, but the characters have been switched. That was never our story. What I hope to do is to give some information so that we have um, some great um, information. Uh, it, may not be the, it may not be the most wonderful and journal story, but it is an accounting nonetheless that we all need to have. So without further ado, I'm going to begin reading White Cargo, The Forgotten History of Britain's White Slaves in America, because it gives better detail into the thinking and what propelled the, the, the British moors of Great Britain to, <laughs> to um, launch this huge campaign to to, to Exile their surplus, this is what they call it, surplus of slaves out of Great Britain to work forever on the, um, in the Americas as well. This, this, this book breaks down the whole rationale. So we begin with the introduction. And it is entitled, In the Shadow of the Moon. Slavery they can have everywhere. It is a weed that grows in every soil, every verb. That man, that man who is the property of another, is his mere chattel, though he continue a man. Aristotle, a treatise on government. In the summer of 2003, archaeologists excavated a 17th century site outside Annapolis, Maryland and discovered the skeleton of a teenage boy. Examination showed the boy to have died sometime in the 1660s. He was about 16 years old and had tuberculosis. His skull, his skull showed evidence of a fearful mouth infection and herniated discs and other injuries to his back were synonymous with years of hard toil. Youth was neither African nor Native American. He was Northern European, probably English. 
His remains were found in what had been the cellar of a 17th century house in a hole under a pile of household waste. It was as if the boy was of so little account that after he died, he was thrown out with the rubbish. Forensic anthropologists believe the youth is probably an indentured servant. The deceptively mild label commonly refused to describe hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children shipped from Britain to America and the Caribbean in the 150 years before the Boston Tea Party in 1773. Most of these servants to the Americas by selling the right to their labor for a number of years. Others were forcibly exiled and sold in the colonies as servants for up to 14 years. Many were effectively equal. While the Spanish slaughtered in America for gold, the English in America had a patch of plan for their wealth. Failing to find the expected mineral riches along the eastern seaboard, they turned to farming, hoping to make gold from tobacco. They needed a compliant, subservient, preferably free labor force, and since the indigenous peoples of America were difficult to enslave, they turned to their own homeland to provide. They imported Britain deemed to be surplus people. The ruthless, the unemployed, the criminal, and the dissident, and held them in the Americas in various forms of bondage for anything from three years to life. This book tells the story of these victims of empire. They were all supposed to gain their freedom eventually. For many, it didn't work out that way. In the early decades, Half of them died in bondage. This book tracks the evolution of the system in which tens of thousands of whites were held as chattel, marketed like cattle, punished brutally, and in some cases, literally to death. For decades, this underclass was treated just as savage as black slaves, and indeed, toiled, suffered, and rebelled alongside them. Eventually, a racial wedge was thrust between white and black, leaving blacks officially enslaved and whites apparently upgraded, but in reality, just as enslaved as they were before. According to contemporaries, some rights, some whites, were treated with less humanity than the blacks working alongside them. Among the first, some were dispatched by impoverished parents seeking a better life for them, but others were forcibly deported. In 1618, the authorities in London began to sweep up hundreds of troublesome urchins from the slums and, ignoring protests from the children and their families, shipped them to Virginia. England's richest man was behind this mass expulsion. It was presented as an act of charity. The starving children were to be given a new start as apprentices in America. In fact, they were sold to planters to work, and half of them were dead within a year. Shipments of children continued from England and then from Ireland for decades. Many of these migrants were little more than toddlers. In 1661, the wife of a man who imported four Irish boys into Maryland and servants wondered why her husband had not brought some cradles to have them rocked in as they were so little. A second group of forced migrants from the mother country were those such as vagrants and petty criminals whom England's rulers wished to be rid of. The legal ground was prepared for their relocation by a highwayman turned Lord Chief Justice who argued for England's goal to be empty in America. 
thanks to men like him, 50 to 70,000 convicts, or maybe more, were transported to Virginia, Maryland, Barbados, and England, other American since 1776. All manner of others considered undesirable by the British by the British crowd were also dispatched across the Atlantic to be sold into servitude. They ranged from beggars to prostitutes, Quakers to cavaliers. A third group were the Irish. For centuries, Ireland had been something of a special case in English colonial history. From the Anglo Norman onward, the Irish were inhumanized, described as savages, so making their murder and enslavement appear all the more justified. The colonization of Ireland provided experience and drive for experiments further afield, not to mention large numbers of workers coerced, transported, or persuaded. Under Oliver Cromwell's ethnic cleansing policy in Ireland, unknown numbers of Catholic men, women, and children were forcibly transported to the colony, and it did not end with Cromwell. For at least another hundred years, forced transportation continued as a fact of life in Ireland. The other unwilling participants in the colonial labor force were the kidnapped. Astounding numbers were reported to have been snatched from the streets and countryside by gangs of kidnappers or spirits, working to satisfy the colonial hunger for labor. Based at sizable ports in the British Isles, spirits conned and coerced the unwary onto ships bound for La America. London's most active kidnap gangs discussed their targets at a daily meeting in St. Paul's Cathedral. They were reportedly paid two pounds by planters, agents, for every athletic-looking young man they brought aboard. According to a contemporary campaign against the black slave trade, kidnappers were snatching an average of around 10,000 whites a year. Doubtless an exaggeration, but one that indicates a problem serious enough to create its own grip on the popular mind. Along with the vast numbers ejected from Britain and forced to slaves in the colony were the still greater multitudes who went of their own free will. Those who became indentured servants in the Americas in return for free passage and perhaps the promise of a plot of land between 1620 and 1775, these volunteer servants, some 300,000, accounted for two out of three migrants from the British Isles. Typically, these free willers, as they came to be called, were the poor and the hopeful who agreed to sacrifice their personal liberty for a period of years in the eventual hope of a better life. On arrival, found that they had the status of chattel, objects of personal property with few effective rights. But there was no going back. They were stuck like the tar on the tail of the ship that brought them. Some, of course, were brought by humane, even generous masters who survived their years of bondage quite happily to emerge from servitude to build a prosperous future. But some of them looked a few servants were from among the three willers. It invites uproar to describe as slaves any of these hapless whites who were abused, beaten, and sometimes killed by their masters or their masters overseers. To do so is thought to distract from the enormity of black suffering after racial slavery developed. However, black slaves emerged out of white servitude and were based upon it. As the African-American writer Lerone Burnett, Bennett Jr. has observed, quote, when someone removes the cataract of blindness from our eyes and when we look with unclouded vision on the blood shadows of the American past, we will recognize for the first time that the Afro-American who was so often was also second in slavery, end quote. Of course, 
black slavery had hideous aspects that whites did not experience, but they suffered horrors in common, many of which were first endured by whites. In crude economic terms, indentured servants sold their labor for a set period of time. In reality, they sold themselves. They discovered that they were placed under the power of masters who had more or less total control over their debt. The indentured servant system evolved into slavery because of the economic goals of early colonies. It was designed not so much to help racist migrants get to America and the Caribbean as to provide a cheap and compliant workforce for the cash crop industry. Once this was established, to keep the workforce in check, it became necessary to create legal sanctions that included violence and physical restraint. This is what led to slavery first for whites, then for blacks. It has been argued with black servants, I mean, it has been argued that white servants could not have been truly enslaved because there was generally a time limit for their enforced labor, whereas black slavery was for life. However, Slavery is not defined by time, but by the experience of its subject. To be the chattel of another, to be required by law to give absolute obedience to everything, and to be subject to whipping, branding, and chaining for any show of defiance. To be these things, as were many whites, was to be enslaved. Daniel Defoe, writing in the early 1770s, as mostly as more properly called slave. Taking his cue, we should call a slave slave. I'm sorry, taking his cue, we should call a slave a slave. How many of these whites who migrated from Britain were subject to the abuses we associate with slavery? 100,000, 200,000, 300,000? It is impossible to know. No one did compile, nor could they have compiled such statistics. All we can be sure of is that the numbers were considerable. Time and again, the evidence shows that to be the case. Too many white servants ran from their masters. Too many instances of ill treatment surfaced. And there were too many damaging admissions throughout the years of British rule for white slavery to be a rarity or a localized apparition that was quickly corrected. In 1663, about the time the wretched 16-year-old buried uh, in the Annapolis cellar breathed his last, the Virginia Assembly warned that the barbarous usage of some servants by cruel masters was given the colony such a bad name that immigrants would stop coming voluntarily. As the case, as the case in this book concerns. That barbarous usage was widespread and prolonged on the American mainland and in Britain's Caribbean colonies. Throughout the colonial period, those who were sold into servitude or who sold themselves as servants formed the majority of immigrants. But they even short shrift from historians. In the words of the social historian Gary D. Nash, most depictions of early America as a garden of opportunity, airbrush indentured servants out of the picture while focusing on the minority who arrived free. A creation myth has flourished in which early American settlers are portrayed as free men and women who created a democratic and egalitarian model society more or less from scratch. The truth could not be more different. The freedoms of modern modern American society evolved only gradually from enforced labor and penal servitude. Many of these instrumental in planning the earliest colonies were like the reputably richest man in Elizabethan England, Sir Thomas Smith, ruthless and oblivious to the misery they caused. They were nonetheless often men of vision and extraordinary rebellion. The tale of the white slave trade unfolds through their exuberant lives no less than through those who were their victims. 
European slavery in early America is conceived within two centuries and between three continents. From the tiny band of Englishmen who established Jamestown in 1607 to the slave force of Africa and finally to Captain Cook feeling his way along the shores of what was to become New South Wales in 1770. In 1607, expedition laid the foundation for English settlement in America. And when American independence closed, the mainland colonies to the dumping of convicts and undesirable, Australia provided a new penal colony. In between the stream of humanity flowed in a vast current across the Atlantic, but has since been diverted from its place in the histories of the British Empire and of the United States. As soon as the new nation of America was born to deny the central part played in its establishment by key sections of founding fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters. Those who chose to ignore the place of both the villains and the ill used in this new country's history included contemporary apologists whose motivation was to create both social cohesion and status. In Virginia, the old dominion, where ideals of freedom flourished and where <coughs> America's aristocracy was rooted, it was uh, unacceptable for jailbirds to be discovered lurking in the family tree. In just 10 years after the Declaration of Independence, this is what Thomas Jefferson wrote about Congress. The malefactors sent to America were not sufficient in number to merit enumeration as one class out of three which peopled America. I do not think all numbers ten would amount to two thousand and being principally men eaten up with disease, they married seldom and so predated little. I do not suppose that themselves and their descendants are at present 4,000, which is little more than 1,000 part of the whole inhabitant. In fact, at the time of the Declaration, nearly 1,000 convicts a year were being dumped in America, mostly in Maryland and Virginia. A convict dealer intimated that in the 1700s, more than 30,000 convicts have been sold in Maryland alone. The numbers of convicts and their descendants in the period when Jefferson was writing were not, as he would have it, 1,000 1, part of the whole inhabitant, but in reality, the much more significant one in a 100. However, there continues to be those who deny that large-scale dumping of unredeemable, the wicked, and the plain unlucky had gone on in anything like either the numbers or over the period that we know first. Sidney George Fisher, writing in 1898, claimed that Virginia had avoided convict, paupers, and inferior nationality. The very different reality has been exposed by the pioneering work of leading American historians such as Edmund S. Morgan, David W. Galenson, and A. Roger Eichshire. Nevertheless, right up to the present day, many Americans have difficulty reconciling themselves to the true nature of their descendants. The truth is that in Virginia and Maryland, a significant proportion of the early settlers was composed of convicts. The fact that wealth and nobility could grow from such material testimony not to the importance of bloodstock, but to social evolution. This book features some of the great names of American history who were the masters of white slaves as well as black. It tracks the ruthless kingpins of the white servant trade who bought and sold their human wares, sometimes disguising convicts as regular servants, sometimes hawking servants from settlement to settlement. And it, and it tells the 
tells the story of those they sold and of those who sold themselves. Some refused to be victims and fought the system by running away, by rebellion, and even by murder. Many others succumbed to disease or exploitation or to attacks from Native Americans. Some thrived and laid down roots. This book has mainly been designed along simple chronological lines. Here and there, however, the reader will discover occasional digressions or sidesteps to take a closer look at particular fields of inquiry. We have chosen to limit what we would otherwise be quite, quite a lengthy work <clears throat> to describing what occurred in a small but important group of geographic areas. We concentrate on Virginia and Maryland, for example, where the indentured service system was created and where its poisonous wounds flowered most widely. The, the, the very many colonies in the Caribbean are largely ignored in favor of the dealing in detail with Barbados. So providing a clear account of one important colony unencumbered by multitudes of regional variations. We hope that this approach also helps to clarify the defining difference between the enterprise carried out on the Sugar Islands and the colonization of the American mainland. Broadly, the primary purpose of settlement on the Caribbean islands was to make money. There was little cost of industry. This role fell to the enterprises in America, where profit and empire building went hand in hand. In the great open spaces of America, indentured servants were theoretically expected to survive bondage and prosper in a grand society. On the islands of Barbados, free workers became an ambassador. The Oxford Dictionary defines as slaves persons who are the legal property of another or others and bound to absolute obedience. In short, human chattel. By this definition, white servants were first slaves in America, and it is upon their labor, and later that of African American slaves, that the nation was initially built. Today, tens of millions of white Americans are descended from such chattel. It is a shame that few in America claim these largely forgotten men and women of the early frontiers as their own. All right, and that concludes the introduction. I trust that that was an interesting introduction, and that uh, we're going to move into Chapter 1. Now, for those joining us, we are reading from White Cargo, The Forgotten History in America. It's written by John Jordan and Michael Walsh. And uh, it's uh, quite a lengthy number of pages. Um, I believe the first publishing, this is actually a new publication. Isn't it interesting that this is copyrighted in 2007? The interesting thing about this book is it gives you actual documented references. So this is not a novel. This is a, an account of what took place that we have never been told about. All right? So with that, we're going to move on to Chapter 1. It is 8.20, and I want to try and get through at least three chapters, because this book really goes into breaking down the dynamics of how Great Britain literally put together a system of transporting, as they call them, their supply of slaves from the British land mass, Europe, uh, to the Moroccan-American so we begin with chapter one, a place for the unwanted. <clears throat> Slavery's introduction to the new world took place much as serfdom left old, stealthily and hesitant. Fly arrival over a few decades, hardly noticed except by a few village vigilant uh, pamphleteers, and its mainly silent victims. The seeds of new colonial serfdom was planted in the 1570s when English pride and social freedoms were strong enough for Shakespeare's favorite historian, Raphael Halenshed, to quote, quote, as for slaves, 
Graves and Bachman, we have none. Nay, such is the privilege of our country by the official grace of God and the bounty of our princes that if anyone came thither from other realms, so soon as they set foot on land, they become so free. All know the servile bondage utterly removed from them. End quote. Even as, even as Holland Shed was celebrating this notion of England, forces were at work that would soon produce a very different prospect for tens of thousands of freeborn English men, women, and children who sailed to America either willingly or involuntarily. Within a generation, a system of slave labor would evolve in America that would deprive them of those very freedoms in which Holland shed grew up. One of the catalysts for the white slave trade was the fear that England was in danger of being overwhelmed by the poor and the lungs. A perception of insecurity is still all too recognizable. In the course of a few generations, the population had risen by a third. In 1509, Henry VIII came to the throne to inherit a kingdom of around three million souls. By the time his daughter Elizabeth faced Spanish Armada, 18 years later, she ruled over a population nearer to four million. For landowners, fattened by churchmen acquired during the local reformation and commonly engrafted through the first enclosure act. It was a time of gallivanting renaissance with luxury. But at the other end of the, of the scale, life in the mid-60th century was pitied and disfigured by poverty. Recurrent harvest disasters, enclosures, and economic depressions that left hordes of peasants and laborers was dispossessed and on the margins of survival. Once the monasteries would have offered some supper, but Henry had closed them down, and now the poor roamed the countryside and cluttered the camp. In 1570, 2,000 beggars were reported in Coventry alone. A crowd of 20,000 poor people gathered at the funeral of one rich magnate begging for alms. In London between 1550 and 1501, there was an eightfold increase in the number in the number of vagrants ending up in the old Bridgewell Palace, which had become a house of correction. Inevitably, lawlessness increased. A statute of 1572 begins with the Lamman, quote, all the parts of this land of England and Wales be presently with rogues, vagabonds, and sturdy beggars exceedingly captured by means where of daily happiness in the same realm horrible murders, thieves, and other great outrage to the high displeasure of Almighty God and to the great annoyance of the common whale. End quote. One of the most bloodstained figures of the age, a free. Gilbert, half-brother of Walter Raleigh, promoted the idea of finding a solution in America. Gilbert has been left to the historical shape, brilliant siblings, but he was as much a Renaissance man as Raleigh. He was born into minor gentry in the West Country and began his career as a page to the future Queen Elizabeth. Before taking to soldiering, whereupon he gained a reputation for cold-blooded ruthlessness. However, he was also a poet, classical scholar, and visionary who inspired a generation of fellow Englishmen with thoughts of empire in America. Humphrey Gilbert made his mark during the religious wars that gripped France in the early 1560s. This was a saga of massacre, torture, and atrocity exemplified by the Huguenot captain who wore a neck of tree spear around his neck. Nearly a century later, 
Michelle wrote from this concert, quote, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction, end quote. While still in his early 20s, Gilbert headed the contingent of 1,000 English Protestants fighting on the Huguenot side. He exhibited dash and bravery with cold too, making a practice of taking no food. Those who were captured were invariably on hanged. Impressed as always by young in 1569, the Queen was in command of English troops in Munster, where the English responded to a revolt by launching an ethnic cleansing campaign to replace the native Irish with plantations of English products. In this gory arena, the ambitious young firebrand demonstrated an inflexibility an implacability unsurpassed by either Oliver Cromwell or William of Orange a century later. In every stronghold that offered resistance, Gilbert slaughtered wholesale, scoring the countryside for anyone who got away. Quote, I slew all those that did belong to see a company or maintain any outlaw or traitor, how many lives whatsoever it cost putting man, woman, and child to the sword, end quote. The severed heads of his victims were stuck on rows of pipes on either side of the path leading to his tent. Gilbert explained that it brought great terror to the people when they saw the heads of their fathers, brothers, children, kinfolk, and friends. Tens of thousands died. Humphrey Gilbert was nice. It is one of the paradoxes of human nature that the most, most ruthless often have a well-developed sense of the romantic. And so it was with Sir Humphrey. In France, he is thought to have met seafarers who had crossed the Atlantic and to have developed a fascination with the marriage. Marriage to a Kentish parent called Anne Alger in 1570 enabled him to retire from the Queen's service by a seat in the Parliament and devote himself to what soon became his obsession. Gilbert believed the North American continent was an island and, like a number of contemporaries, burned to prove the existence of a northwest passage to China through the Arctic Circle. After studying every manuscript and possible text that he could find, he produced a scholarly looking race course to support his own theory, and with it, almost as an aside, the first detailed blueprint for English colonization of North America. It was said that his ge- geography, if learned and often ingenious, was mostly preposterous. However, it was convincing enough for the Queen and her council, and in 1578, Gilbert was granted leave to go ahead. He was given six years to found a colony. His motives weren't of course purely altruistic. For Gilbert, as for so many empire builders, personal aggrandizement and the national interest happily went hand in hand. He ordered up written versions of the stories of a sailor called David Ingram, who'd been shipwrecked in Florida and spent two years trekking through North America. Ingram had just returned with fantastical tales women wearing plates of gold like armor. Men decorated with pearls as big as one's thumb, and houses upheld by pillars of gold, silver, and crystal. If gold there was, Gilbert aimed to grab the lion's share. In his scheme, the envisaged territory would be the fiefdom of the crown that he would wear, taking an 80% share of any gold or silver. The humble servant would retain 
ever sent was his feet. Gilbert's blueprint of a Pakistan, from the size of the first colony, a mere 9 million acres, right down to street layouts and the number of churches. In retrospect, the most significant part of the plan was the suggestion of where to find the colony's manhunt. He proposed transporting such needy people of our country, which now trouble the Commonwealth, and drew one here at home are forced to commit outrageous offenses whereby they are daily consumed with the gallows. It is difficult to reconcile the humanity infusing this passage with the butcher of Munster. One historian has suggested that Gilbert was mellowed by his experiences in Ireland. A more reliable explanation may be that self-interest stood behind altruism's lofty mass. There were precedences for Gilbert's speech. Convict labor had featured from the earliest European foyer into the Americas. In Spain, the difficulties of persuading free men to try their luck in the unknown had prompted King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel in 1497 to promise a pardon to convicts facing death if they would agree to go on Christopher Columbus's third expedition. Half a century later, the Marquis de la Roche an old adversary of Gilbert took his pick from the Breton jail of men successive expeditions to parts of the New World that Gilbert had in Ireland. It was said that the La Roche's ships were deep freighted with vice. At first, the queen was reluctant to let Gilbert go. She was anxious to keep her former cage full of hands to stay down further directions in Ireland. But Gilbert was backed by his persuasive half brother Walter Raleigh. Elizabeth emerging favorite, and she finally agreed. The letter's patent allowed him to claim that tract of America in the Queen's name. Only those areas to the south already ruled by Christian princes were officially precluded. I those already invaded by the Spanish and Portuguese. However, with her habitual eye on the main chain, Elizabeth secretly gave Gilbert to go ahead to plunder the Spanish and Portuguese wherever he found them. In an equally typical move, the Queen would not fund the venture. Gilbert had to raise the money from friends and relations and any adventurous spirit who agreed to accompany him. He recorded how he only managed to fit out his fleet of ten ships after selling the boat off his wife's back. In 1578, he took sail with a large fleet and 500 men, including at least one convict who had been reprieved from execution and handed over to him. His 27-year-old half-brother, Walter, furnished his own ship and came too. For Gilbert, it must have been a mouth-watering prospect. The royal license entitled him to total control over a land expected to be a watch with gold and silver, just like the Spanish-American colony. But a combination of bad luck in fighting Bad weather and bad leadership turned the expedition into a disaster when it was buried out of English water. A decimated fleet returned home without either crossing the Atlantic. Undeterred, Gilbert tried again in 1580. Without Raleigh this time, he followed in the track of the fishing fleet to the Grand Bank and made landfall at the bleak fishing outpost of St. John in Newfoundland. The bass, Portuguese, and French fishermen already had anchor there were no doubt bewildered as Gilbert flourished his royal commission and claimed Newfoundland as English. He then issued licenses for them all to continue fishing and just as suddenly departed. 
fleet headed westing along the dangerous eastern seaboard for a site to settle. It was not to be, however. Foul weather increased with fog and mist, and Yelder's larger ship foundered and was lost. Morale collapsed, and demands grew for a return home. Most of the great Elizabethan seafarers at one time or another were threatened by mutiny in similar situations, and most faced down the threat. Gilbert, however, could not. He reluctantly conceded an immediate return, but least anyone think him a coward, he announced that he would brave the storm on the journey home by sailing on the smallest, most vulnerable ship, a ten-ton brig called the Squirrel. It was a typical act of Elizabethan broad gaudocious and fatal. The Squirrel was overloaded with guns, tackle, and provisions. When the fleet encountered heavy seas, Gilbert was urged to transfer to the comparative safety of his flagship, the Golden Hen, but refused. He vowed that he would not desert the shipmate with whom he had faced so many perils. A storm developed and the thrill began to found it. Gilbert's last reported words shot into the golden hand had a fatalism that made him more famous in England than anything he had previously done. Quote, we are as near to heaven by sea as by land, he called and resumed reading the book as waves broke over the tiny vessel. The book was said to have been Thomas More's Utopia. The manner of his death made Gilbert a national hero. Three centuries later, the image of the visionary adventurer swept away under the waves was still being immortalized in verse by Longfellow. Alas, the land's wings failed and ice cold through the night, and never more on sea or shore should the Humphrey see the light. Walter Raleigh waited just long enough to be sure that Gilbert had indeed drowned. His half-brother's mantle and made the American project his own. The queen, already showering favors on Raleigh, was prevailed upon to grant him the same free hand given to Gilbert. And Raleigh set to work selling America to would be backers. Some later romantics would portray Raleigh as one of their own, but essentially, as the historian David Beers puts it, he was an acute and hard dealing businessman. Colonization was a business which he undertook to promote. His first step with the commission was a, what was effectively a market report on the new world. The man he employed to undertake it was Richard Hucklett. Then, at the start of a career that would make him the world's leading geographer, a clergyman by profession, Hucklett had become fascinated as a student with the discoveries that were opening up the further ocean. He made himself an expert in the field by translating every work of navigation and exploration he could find and interviewing every explorer and seafarer he could track down. Like a 16th century paparazzi, he pounded from port to port to greet the Drake, the Hawkins, the Gilbert, returning from their latest trip of piracy in order to cast an eye over their ship's law. Huckless had just published his first major work on geography when Bali, with his rare eye for young talent, hired him to write about America. The result was a persuasive piece of propaganda, the discourse concerning Western planting. Echoing Gilbert's theme of an English being engulfed by the longest war in America as her salvation, Huckless claimed that the country was so populous that people were ready to pick up one another. In their desperation, so many of the churches find that all the churches of the land are daily pastored and stuffed full of them where either they pitifully pine away or are miserably happy. How much better, Huckless suggested evangelistically, to put the wretches to work in a colony overseas. He reeled off a list of America's resources and set up the different industries that should flourish there. There were more than 40 of them, ranging from tar making, gold mining, and cotton picking, to diving 
of her. It is a mark of us hopeless judgment that only all would one day rise in appearance. While Hustle was still riding, two of Molly's ships were probing the theory of what is now South Carolina's possible settlement site. In 1584, they sent home reports ranging from the top nature of the assad. The godliest soil under the top of heaven we have found here made, whose air yield corn or bread 400 upon one ear. And the cane makes very good and perfect sugar. It is the most pleasing territory of the world, the territory and soil of Chesapeake. For pleasantness of sea, for temperature of climate, for fertility of soil, and for the commodities of the sea, is not to be excelled by any other whatsoever. The next year, a fleet of settlers was back. The story of Raleigh's lost colony is well known. The faithful selection of the mosquito ridden island of Renault as a site, Raleigh celebrated the naming of the colony Virginia after Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. The three year struggle to sustain this precarious foothold, the disastrous failure to resupply the colonists during the war with Spain, the colonists' unexplained disappearance, and the feudal expedition launched by Raleigh in later years to try to find the lost people. Queen Elizabeth's beneficence had made Raleigh wealthy. She is reported to have peered at forth and crested with jewels from head to foot. But the American venture drained his resources. He reputed me spent 40,000 pounds on his voyages, equivalent to approximately 6 million pounds in today's money. And although he remained obsessed with Virginia in 1590, he leaked out the patent, entitling him to colonize it, retaining the right to 20% of all gold or silver discovered, the same cost he had agreed to pay the queen when his hopes retired. He also retained the right to veto any other weak colonists in Virginia. The new holders of the patent included three of his friends, Richard Hustle, John White, and the nominal governor of Raleigh Colony, who had returned to Britain before the colonists vanished, and Thomas Smith, a young man destined to play a big role in bringing white slavery to Virginia. Smith had his own vision of the New World and would become the driving force in the Virginia Project. Like Gilbert and Ron, Smith had made his mark in war, both in Ireland and on the continent, and like them, he was much more than a simple soldier. He was a financial genius, and no Englishman better fits the title merchant prince. He could be called England, or indeed America's first cartoon. Smith's father, also a Thomas, was a rich merchant who, during the reign of Bloody Mary, had secured one of the most lucrative franchises in the country. He became chief collector of customs duties, called the Farmer of Customs. This involved paying an agreed annual sum to the royal exchequer and then collecting what he could. Customer Smith, as he became known, kept a job when Elizabeth came to the throne and made a fortune. Some of the proceeds were used to back the piratical expedition of Drake and later of Raleigh, his son's friend. Both would have been hugely successful in that. However, young Thomas left the customer standing. This was the era of the first joint stock company, those harbinging part fingers of capitalism that opened up world trade and would eventually make Britain the dominant world commercial power. Smith Jr. would play a leading role in almost all of this. 
wherever England traded in the late Elizabethan and Jacobin eras, Smith left his fingerprint. In a ruthless, cutthroat age, he conjured deals with rulers across the globe, from the Emperor of Japan to the Tsar of Russia. Just about every major English company that started up in a 35-year period was either initiated or run by him. The East India Company, the Mustavoy Company, the Levin Company, the Summers Island Company, the Northwest Passage Company, the Merchant Adventurers, and eventually the Virginia Company. By the time Thomas Smith bought into the Virginia Enterprise, he was well on his way to becoming the wealthiest merchant in London. With money and commercial success went power. Smith rose through the ranks of London aldermen to become city auditor, sheriff of the city of London, captain of the city's train band, London militia, giving him command of reportedly increasing the case by 100%. Smith was at the century of state over the lawless and the poor that raged during the 19th, not during the 1590s. The decade had started with record poverty, but England was soon hit by the gravest agrarian crisis since the Black Death two centuries earlier. For five successive years, the skies opened and the harvest faded. The price of corn doubled and starvation and plague spread across the nation. Following what was supposed to be a triumphant tour of the land to mark victory over the Spanish Palmada, the Queen complained that paupers are everywhere. Magistrates were ordered to take control of corn supplies and profiteers were punished. In Colchester and Essex, aldermen were required to donate loans of 20 pounds and councillors 10 pounds to buy corn to feed the poor. A baker was appointed in every ward to bake three seeds of bread a day to give to the hungry. Parliament's response was to introduce another new law in the late 1590s to control the poor. One of the most daunting and corrupt of the Elizabeth ministry, her Lord Chief Justice, Sir John Holpen, drew up the bill. Smith served on the ground on the Grand Committee that debated it. The ferocious measure required parishes to support the infant poor, the old, disabled, sick, but specified severe punishment for the able bonds, those rogues and vagabonds who, in the view of the debtor place, should be able to look after themselves. Tinkers, gypsies, Beggars, begging scholars, pawn readers, wandering musicians, and actors were all defined as vagabonds. One William Shakespeare, who had possibly been a wandering actor not many years before, must have felt relieved that his would have protected him from the act. Among the punishments was transportation. The new law decreed that those who would not be reformed of their roguish kind of life, shall be banished out of this realm and shall be conveyed into such parts beyond the sea as shall be any time hereafter for that purpose assigned by the Privy Council or Privy Council. But transported where? At this stage, it evidently didn't matter. The imperative was simply to get rid of the undesired. Sir John Colton announced that the act would be used to drive from the gates of thieves and traitors to be drowned in the sea. But as the Elizabethan era juice was closed, the legislation lay in an in abeyance, unused for several years while the country became consumed with the succession to the throne. During the climate that developed in the Elizabeth in the Queen's last year, Smith's contribution to history was nearly cut short. 
He seemed to have been a thoroughly political preacher with a reassuring all things and all men persona that he deployed to recruit allies with her. One friendship he established was with Elizabeth's greatest faith, the flamboyant vain Robert Deborah, Earl of Sussex. Um, sorry, Earl of Essex. In 1596, the budding merchant prince emerged from his town house to join the Earl of Essex in an expedition that climate in the famous attack on Essex. There was no material political purpose. It was simply a raid for plunder, and it was a financial triumph. The city was sacked, and the raiders returned home laden with booty. One report has Essex knighting Smith for bravery on the Spanish doctrine. Given their report, it was hardly surprising that when Essex tried to mount a fisted pop against Elizabeth in 1501, he might have expected support from Smith and his city militia. He was to be disappointed. On the morning of the 6th, Essex arrived at Smith's door with armed supporters, only to find the clearly agitated merchant refusing to help. Grabbing the bridle of Earl's horse, Smith urged his friend to give himself up and then retreated into his mansion. Essex surrendered later that day and was swiftly executed. Thomas Smith nearly followed him. Under interrogation, the Earl supporters claimed that Smith had egged Essex on and vowed to deploy his militia in support. Suspicions were heightened by a report that an emissary from the Earl had delivered a letter to Smith's wife just before the coup. There was also the matter of the Earl's arrival at Smith's house. Smith and his wife were called off to the Tower of London, denying everything. This time, he had had no communication with the Earl for years, and it met him on the fateful horn he hears perhaps on a message from the Lord Mayor. As stories go, it was a lamer excuse and told by many of commoners condemned for treason and sent to Cyburn's triple tree, there to be castrated, disemboweled, hanged, beheaded, and dismembered. Smith was spared. Perhaps because he had lent Elizabeth thirty one thousand pounds to help equip the fleet that defeated the Spanish Armada. Perhaps because it was thought not to be financially prudent to kill the richest man in the country. Whatever the reason, it was in order to take a substantial fine. In the language of the Privy Council, Thomas Smith had forgotten his duty to a magic. The great merchant did not languish long in the spring. In March 1503, the 69-year-old Elizabeth was overcome by an illness that signaled the end of her long reign. Her successor, James I, was generous to all those who had been linked to the Essex Rebellion, including Thomas Smith. The main reason was that James himself had plotted with Essex. Within a month of assuming the English throne, James not only restored Smith to all his offices, but also united. Sir Thomas Smith would be James's first chief advisor on trade with a special interest in the colonization of the New World. Smith would hold this power for the rest of his life and use it to ensure that when England's new power was eventually planted, in America it would survive whatever the human cost in life or liberty. He had taken the first step three years later when he joined a race to plant the first permanent colony in Virginia and found that his rival was the most feared man in the realm, Sir John Fulton. All right, that concludes, oh my goodness, that concludes chapter one. Oh, I so want to read chapter two. Ah, oh, but it's nine o'clock. Hmm, it's not that long. I can go on. 
and then we can have our discussion. I'm going to continue. We're going to read chapter two, and then we're going to open up our line, open up the line, so that we can have a discussion on the information that was read. There were so many interesting points made, but I want to press on. I want to get through chapter two um, because it gives you some it gives you some great background. So let's continue. Chapter 2, The Judge's Dream. The Kennebec River runs gently down through the wooded uplands of Maine to the sea. Its source is New Ped Lake, a stretch of water so large that it was once mistaken for the China Sea. From this great lake, the Kennebec goes 150 miles through New England before draining into the North Atlantic Miracle Kingdom. Ruin of so many previous ventures. 
joint stock companies were relatively few entities in which individuals owned shares that could sell without reference to their fellow stockholders. These companies were opening the far corners of the globe to English trade. So why not as joint stock companies to fund the next big English push to colonize America? Interest in America has been largely dormant since 1590, when the financial drain persuaded Walter Raleigh to give up his Renaultian adventure. Twelve years went by, and then a new round of exploration began. It was led by Bartholomew Gosnell, a friend of Richard Tuckler and Raleigh, accompanied by Bartholomew, Bartholomew Gilbert, one of the Humphrey Gilbert's six sons, Gosnold landed in New England in 1602 and stayed for several months trading and exploring. They returned with sensational reports that rhapsodized over the natural riches of the New World. Quote, the soil is fat and lusty, cherry trees like ours, but the stalks bear the blossom or fruit, which are like a, all sorts of fowls whose young ones we took and ate at our pleasure, ground nuts as big as eggs, end quote. Gosno summed up their reaction as they caught the first sight of all this plenty. We stood a while as ravished. The following year, a merchant from Bristol, Martin Craig, landed in Virginia looking for the sassafras tree a root of which then institutes the French pop, and is today a marvelous piece of serendipity used in the perfumery trade. Two years after Prince George Weymouth came looking for a settlement site in what is now Maine, Prince and Weymouth were down to earth seamen with none of Gosnell's descriptive fear. I mean, clear, but they did enough soak the fires of enthusiasm for America still more. The land is full of God's true blessings, the friends. They must say the same thing more graphically, returning with intriguing samples of plants and animal life and five captured Native Americans, all London wanted to see. Despite the fact that Gosnell and the other Mariners had found not a Graph of evidence for the existence of gold mines, these expeditions sparked new speculation about gold waiting to be discovered in America. The fantastical stories of gold city brought back three decades earlier by that wandering seaman David Ingram had not been forgotten, and American gold became the talk of the taverns and counting houses. The Spanish dream of El Dorado the golden man had led to the discovery of fantastic treasures in South America. The English, it was argued, would find theirs in the northern continent. <clears throat> A taste of the fantastic hope that developed can be had from Ben Johnson's satire on gold fever, eastward home, staged at the same time as Schaefer on Macbeth. Johnson imagined the lost Renaultian colonists marrying into the local population and living in a social a society literally covered in gold. One man explained the character, all this dripping pants are pure gold, and all the chains with which they chain up their streets are made messy gold. All the prisoners they take are fettered in gold. And for rubies and diamonds, they go forth on holidays and gather them by the seashore. It was in this atmosphere that the charter authorizing the two new four days to America were drawn out, and two joint stock companies of knights, gentlemen, merchants, and other adventurers created for the purpose. The two principal aims were announced as bringing infidels and savages living in those parts to human civility and the mining of gold, silver, and copper. Three of the crown's leading 
consulars helped draft the document. Robert Cecil, Chief Secretary of State, Sir Edward Cook, Attorney General, and the fearsome Lord Chief Justice, Sir John Fulton. Cecil emerged as principal patron of the company that was allocated the Southern Territory, lying roughly between what is now Florida and New York. It was composed of men drawn mainly from our city of London and inevitably known as the London Company. The latter, the Virginia Company. The key post of treasurer of the company equivalent to managing director was taken by Sir Thomas Smith. Sir John Holcomb was the principal investor in the second company drawn from our cities of Bristol and Exeter and of our town of Plymouth and allocated New England. It came to be known as the Plymouth Company. Popham was a man whose character was written in his face. In one portrait, he appeared a physical giant. The scarlet robes of the high court clutched around his bulk, a heavy, ugly face wearing out, cold eyes, honey, and suspicion, the face of a calculating, unstoppable bully. In his voluminous lives of the chiefess of England, Lord Campbell referred to the portrait and had death decorously, quote, I am afraid he would not appear too great advantage in a sketch of his moral quality, which leaps I do him an injustice I will not accept, end quote. Sir John was the man who had passed the death sentence on Sir Walter Raleigh, telling him it is best for man not to speak to find too high meat. He had participated in the trial of Mary and condemned to death Guy Fall and hundreds more. The miracle was that he did not join them on the gallows himself. Before he occupied one by one most of the great legal offices of state, John Popham had been a highwayman, and according to one rumor, probably a garroter too. Fulton was born in 1531 into an affluent Somerset family. He read law at Valio College, Oxford, and in his 20s, he was called to the bar and respectively married. Even then, however, he was exhibiting a different side of his character. He was a heavy drinker and gambler, and according to Lord Campbell, either to supply his prolific expenditures or to show his spirit. Popham, quote, frequently sailed for a night from a home hill in Southwood with a band of desperate characters and planting themselves to ambush on Shooter's Hill or taking other positions favorable for attack and escape. They stopped travelers and took from them not only their money, but any valuable commodities they carried with them, boasting that they were always civil and generous and that to avoid serious consequences, they went in such numbers as to render resistance impossible, end quote. Popham's antics continued right through his 20s. Amazingly, he was never caught. In his 30s, he decided he could make as much money from the law as from a highway robbery and developed an extensive practice in southwest England that brought him to the attention of the queen. With her rare ability to pick ruthless talent that could be used for dead, Elizabeth arranged a seat in Parliament for him. The former highwayman became Speaker of the House, then Attorney General, and finally Lord Chief Justice. He was a hanging judge, said Campbell. Ordinary larcenies and, above all, in highway robbery, there was little chance of acquittal. <laughs> oh, my goodness, that is not ironic. It was the same with those who did not fit the Protestant orthodoxy the crown was trying to mold. 
Sir John persuaded outspoken Puritans and Catholic priests to be scaffolds. I'm sorry, to the scaffold. Under him, hundreds of Jesuits and suspected sympathizers were sent to Tyburn or Smithfield to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, or, if a woman, perhaps to be crushed to death or strangled before being burned at the stake. When it came to the rich, Sir John could be lenient if the price was right. There was no more corrupt age than the Elizabethan, and the future Lord Chief Justice proved himself as viable or soon. In the 1580s, a midwife story horrified all who heard it. She told of being taken blindfolded in a closed coach to accept the delivery of a child in a great house, and after the birth, seeing a madman seize the newborn infant and cast it into the fire where it kept. And the story became known, and he was fight with rage for the per- perpetrator of what Lord Macaulay called his horrible and mysterious crime. The murderer was tracked down, and he be let off after he paid the judge in the case a truly massive bribe in the shape of his mansion, Little Cock Hall in Whitshire. John Popham was the, dr- was the judge. By this and other means, he became a very rich man. He left behind him the greatest estate that has ever been amassed by any lawyer. This intimidating man was involved in colonialism years before the Plymouth Company was created. In the 1580s, the Queen decided to stamp out rebellion forever in Munster by confiscating the vast estate there of the Desmond family and repopulating them with English Protestants. Catholic Irish were ordered out, and the land was offered at two cents an acre to English landlords who undertake planting with tenants from England. Popham was one of many who saw himself accumulating a huge Irish estate. He assembled more than 80 families and dispatched them to Munster. However, Another English worthy was already off the mark and had tenanted the land, leaving Popham's tenants no choice but to return home. A few decades later, a not dissimilar scheme called the Headright system would be introduced in America, and the wealthy would become still richer by obtaining grants of land for importing the poor to settle the new world. The experience in Munster did not deter Popham from such schemes, and his lordship was soon propelled toward far more ambitious projects of colonizing America. He was now in his late 50s. So why did the New World consume him in the last years of his life? The avarice of a rascal's old man certainly played a part, but for Popham, it was also about the pursuing of a dumping ground for the criminals and even he, the Dragonian law officer, could never eradicate. As we have seen, social conditions had produced levels of criminal crime that frightened the gentry. Now, as the century ended, a new crime wave swept over England. This was the price of peace in Spain. For, as ever, when the major war ended, newly released soldiers and mariners stood across the land. Many of these men had been criminals beforehand and returned to their former profession. In Plymouth, London, Bristol, and York, they had taken the Queen's shilling as an alternative to the rope. In the late 1590s, when war with Spain wound down and peace negotiations began, the land then swarmed with people who had been soldiers who had never gotten or else quite forgotten any other vocation, too proud to beg, too lazy to labor, these infected the highways with their felonies. In 1597, the year before the Treaty of Bourbon officially ended the war, Popham had pushed through Parliament a tough new vagrancy act described in the previous chapter, under which persistent felonies could be banished to parts of 
John the King at the behest of members of the prison council. The act was a prelude to what was to come. Five years later, Hoffman drew up an order in council identifying those parts of John the King where England's unwanted could be done. Newfoundland, the East and West Indies, France, Germany, Spain, and the Low Countries, or any of them. As will be seen, some of these were meant to all seriousness. Virginia would soon be added to the list. At this point, an enigmatic character entered Tottenham's life. Sir Ferdinando Borges was captain and keeper of Plymouth Castle. He was said to be a vain, very audacious man, hardly any more attractive than Sir John. The two men in 1601 during the most tangled of Tudor dramas, the attempted suit by Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex. Gorgeous was supposed to be an Essex supporter when the coup began. Essex entrusted him with guarding three members of the Queen's Council who were being held in Essex House, the Earl Sumptuous Seventh-day Palace. Compton was one of the captains. To their surprise, Gorgeous turned out to be their rescuer rather than jailer, and he had the party ruled up the rich Whitehall and safety. It later transpired that from the beginning, Georgie had leaked details of the plot to Essex's longtime rival, Walter Raleigh, who in turn kept the Queen constantly updated. Georgie was the key witness against Essex when the former royal favorite was tried for treason, condemned, and sent to the block on our hill. While his part of the plot was investigated, Gorgeous was imprisoned in the South. As that other recurring figure in our story, Sir Thomas Smith, had learned an involvement in the Essex plot, however slight, damned you in the old Queen's house. Sir Ferdinando, no, Sir Ferdinando found himself held for nine months and deprived of his military post in Denham. When James I acceded to the throne, he immediately reinstated and held in high favor. Gorgeous George Weymouth, in 1605, expedition to the North Atlantic Coast. Upon his return, Weymouth presented him with five members of the Wabanaki and Freemakid tribe he had captured. The idea was to exhibit them around England to drum up interest in the colonial enterprise. The captives demonstrated their skill in handling a dugout canoe on the river Thames, and according to the Spanish ambassador, Don Pedro de Funda, they were quickly taught English so they could say how good that country, America, is for people to go there and inhabit it. George's wants to talk to his house uh, for the in his American venture and presented the Lord Chief Justice with two of his Native Americans. The two men were still partners and they aimed to bring together burghers from London and Plymouth and members of the gentry who had previously invested in expeditions. Top of the list would have been great merchants like Smith and aristocrats like Henry Riddlesley, the brilliant Earl of Southampton, who was William Shakespeare's patron. Most of the lobbying appears to have taken place in the vast new banquet hall of the Middle Temple under the coat of arms of Tudor Knights that still hang there today over the heads of other ambitious lawyers. In the winter of 1605 to 06, Pompum approached the Attorney General, Sir Edward Cook. He laid the emphasis not on the riches to be had in America, but on England's desperate need for a dumping ground for criminals. Cook reported their conversation. Quote, my Lord Chief Justice, foreseeing in the experience of this place the infinite number of cashiered captains and soldiers of poor artisans that would and cannot work, and of idle vagrants that may and will not work, whose increased threat to the state is affectionate.
ultimately sent to the plantation of Virginia, end quote. He explained that the judge wanted to go ahead to call the undertakers, gentlemen, merchants, etc., unto him, and by their advice set down the best manner of project, which he agreed upon shall be speedily returned to your lordship, because the best season for the journey is approaching. More talk followed with a great deal of haggle over who was to be in control. Eventually, the Virginia Company was chartered with two divisions, two divisions the London Company and a Plymouth Company. The charter helped to give birth to a mix. Uh, it was a remarkable document from a king who felt the divine right to rule and conceded no powers without a struggle. In a section on how the colonies were to govern, James said, quote, I do live an order that my loving subjects in America shall forever enjoy the right to make all needful laws for their own government, provided only that they be consonant with the laws of England, end quote. 260 years later, when the American Civil War, the war for enslaved, had been won by the northern states, the New England historian John A. Ford traced the region's belief in human rights back to James Charter. This charter of liberty was never revoked, he crowed. Quote, it was a decree of universal emancipation and every man of any color from any crime was by this act of King James redeemed, regenerated, disenthralled the moment he landed on the soil of America between the 34th and the 45th degree. A hundred and fifty years before the decree of Lord Mansfield throughout the change of fetters of Africans in England. It was Bunkum there it was Bunkum. There would be forms of both black and white slavery even in New England throughout the colonial period. Once the charter was issued for his Plymouth Company, Popham wasted no time. His position as Chief Justice gave him controlling influence in all the jails and penitentiaries in the realm. Although there is no chapter and verse on his interest topic, snippets of information from contemporaries leave little doubt that Popham exploited his power. He stocked Virginia out of all the gold of England, reported John Aubrey, the 17th century master of the by our biographical sketch, Popham sent out men who were pressed to that enterprise in danger <clears throat> by the law, wrote the Earl of Sterling, a confidence of fortune. And just hold on a minute while I switch my hair piece. All righty. All right, yes. Yeah. All right, Palm Street sent out men who were pressed to that enterprise in danger by the love of the Earl of Sterling, confident of George Gorgeous, and later a colonist himself. The image lingers in the mind's eye of the hatchet faced Popham handing down rough justice, offering convicts facing ex the options that would become commonplace in later decades. Slaves for years in exile in America possibly to die there or go to the gallery. This choice had the happy effect not only of saving life but of aiding their job financial endeavors. Likely looking specimens for transportation, the young and strong would no doubt be, have been paraded before Sir John's court in inspection. It is difficult to imagine the Lord Chief Justice of England vetting each felon and vagabond the notorious foulness of Jacobian gold. The 
Spanish ambassador to London, Don Pedro de Zuniga, was worried about the threat of Spanish interest in America. He complained the problem and was assured that colonization aimed only to drive thieves out of England. They were sent to be drowned in the sea. <clears throat> in May 1606, Popham and Georgia organized a trial voyage. A vessel called the Richard was dispatched across the Atlantic with 29 men. Also on board were two of the captured Native Americans sent along to act Scott. The expedition for Popham, eight months ahead of the rival Lutman Company, which was sitting out its small fleet in the port of London at Christmas approach, as Christmas approach. The Richard never made landfall. Her captain, Harry Challen, ignored instructions to sail directly west and took the more traditional and supposedly safer route south, hugging the African coast before turning the helm westward. He ran straight into a Spanish fleet off after the Mijo and the Richard was captured. Her ship's company and her would-be colonizers ended up as galley slaves. It is thought significant by historians that Popham made no effort to free this colony. It must be admitted, says his biographer, that he was not fully of urgency about the men to comfort. One reason suggested was that if there were criminals, it was natural that he should leave them to their fate. In a letter to Robert Cecil, Popham wrote, if the natives were to be had again, in my opinion, it would serve to good purpose. But he made no remarks about the others whom the richer. <clears throat> a year later, the judge was ready to try again with a much larger expedition. In May 1607, 20 men shipped out from Plymouth. They sailed in two vessels, a Mary and John, captain by Raleigh Gilbert, a son of Sir Humphrey Gilbert, and the wonderfully named Gift of God, a shallow draw flyboat designed to navigate shallow, unscored rivers. She was captained by Pompham's nephew, George, who was appointed leader of the expedition. The orders were secret, not to be revealed until they arrived in the New World. Kidware, one of the tribesmen captured by Weymouth, was sent as a guide. Sir Fernando Gorges was still very much involved in the venture, but it was now so much the Lord Chief Justice's project that the colony they planned would be known by everyone and by history, too, as the Fulton Colony. Sir Fernando, it seems, contended himself with dreaming of thought. One of his early biographies, the one-time governor of Massachusetts, James Sullivan, described Gorgias as wanting a colony run on feudal lines in which he expected to enjoy the profit at his ease without crossing the Atlantic. His expectations were very great. The gift of God arrived in the mouth of the temple on 13 August, and Mary and John followed three days later. 120 colonists rode ashore to the windy headlands and gathered together for what was first business of every European expedition to the New World, the ser- a service of thanks on dry, dry, dry land. The group thanked the Lord for a safe delivery. Next came the moment all thought present had been waiting for their order, which was issued by Sir John Fulton, was taken from the steel chest in which they were trapped. George Fulton read them out. Few details survived, but the imperative was undoubtedly the search for gold. The discovery of mines was the main intended benefit, reported William Starchin, secretary of the Virginia Company, who wrote A History of Virginia in 1612. Roll the tide all the gold was in fact. According to the story in George Chalmers, Judge Popham's instructions imperatively required that interior should be explored for gold and threatened that in the event of failure, the colonists should remain as banished men in Virginia. Convict Parker.
probably weren't employed on the search but laborers, but labor to construct a star-shaped fort. <clears throat> From surviving records, it appears a fort was thrown up at a furious pace, mostly by unskilled labor. Walls, church, storehouse, and around 50 waddle and dog dwellings were completed by winter. The trick it seemed was to use simple building techniques demanding mainly muscle and sweat. George Pontham was in charge. In charge. He was to be timorously fearful to offend. His peers, but not. One would suspect the gangs of men toiling on the banks of the Tennessee that autumn. The very name of Pontham would put the fear of God into most of them. Plans began to go awry early. The surf for mines of gold or silver was led by 24-year-old Raleigh Hill. Week after week, they found nothing. Kid wears deserted back to his people in relation and in relation with the local Wawena, cannabis and Arosagan top cook people initially promising turned sour. The colonists' behavior was to blame. After one incident when four tribesmen were dragged by their hair aboard the gift of gold and a cap was mounted and 14 colonists were killed. Then an inordinately grim winter descended and all the time not a speck of gold. A sudden piece of dramatic news appeared to have transformed their fortune. Members of the Abinette tribe old told Pompum and Gilbert about a huge stretch of water just seven days walk away. Pompum wrote a reckless letter to King James, claiming the greatest discovery of the new century. This cannot be other than the southern ocean reaching to the regions of China. They had, he claimed, found the fabled Northwest Passage. It was, of course, nonsense. The tribesmen were almost certainly referring to what became known as the Okay Pompon Colony <clears throat> soon ended. After less than a year and a terrible winter, George Pompon died. Believing he had established a permanent foothill in the New World and would go down in history. Quote, I die content, he wrote. My name will always be associated with the first planting of the English race in the New World. My remains will not be neglected away from the home of my fathers and my kindred. <clears throat> George Poppin was wrong. He was forgotten. And so, almost, was the colony. Raleigh Gilbert took over the leadership, supposedly with great plans for expansion. Instead, <clears throat> he packed up and went home. His change of heart surprised everyone, but not for long. The Mary and John had just with provisions and with new. Gilbert's brother, Sir John Gilbert, was dead. Raleigh was heir to his estate in time. It must have been a bombshell for the youngest of seven children, forced to seek his fortune in the new world, but he did not hesitate. He was going home. <clears throat> there had been an, another death, too. This was the news that really gripped the colony. Sir John Fulton had died. The Augra was no more. No retribution for failure awaited them on the quay at Plymouth. Everybody could now go home, and everybody did. The Popham colony encamped for England in mass, leaving the fort to decay. The colony had lasted little more than a year, and the colonists returned with little more than a few hundred first. Most of those involved blamed the dreadful winter. Across the northern hemisphere, it had been the worst in memory. All our hopes had been frozen to death, though, to Ferdinando Forges. The returning colonists reported that the miracle was over quote, and in respect to of that not habitable by our nation. In years to come, some patriotic Americans 
historian expressed relief that the venture had failed. The abortion of Sagadoha was the first, the last, the only attempt of the English corporation to fasten a moral pestilence on our northern shores, said the 19th century historian John Wingate Thornton. The Popham colony might have failed, but its philosophy would be revived many miles to the south, where the rival colony named Jamestown succeeded in putting down permanent roots within a decade. Condit and other sensations of England cast off would begin to arrive in the new world with the king's blessing. And that concludes chapter two. <laughs> and we went, let's see, it's nine forty and um what I'm gonna do now is open up the line for a discussion, we have about 45 minutes to have a discussion about what was read. And then what we'll do after that, well, shoot, after that, the lines are going to go down and the broadcast will be over. Anyone who would like to participate in the discussion, press 1 on your telephone dial. And what I will do is I will unmute you one. One, and we will talk about what was just unveiled. It was very interesting. Uh, it was quite a bit of little tidbits of information. <clears throat> and I trust some of us listening got it also <laughs> because it was very, very, very interesting. All right, so please press one on your cell phone. Dial and I will begin to unmute you. And of course, we have our first unmuted. Um, <clears throat> unmuted is Roz Mariah. <laughs> and it's Mom. It's Mom. Thank you for giving the bedtime story for all of the nation. <laughs> <laughs> that other people are thinking the same thing. It's like, is this about modern European colonists who are slaves, you know? Like, I wanted to, like, remind ourselves that we are talking about, you know, the original slaves, and they repeat it all the time, coming to the American land. Interesting. Yes. Yes. A lot of it. And, and, you know, a lot of it is interesting because what they're telling you is a lot of these people who you're hearing pain to power, you know, such as the Lord Chief Justice, who was formerly a highwayman. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right? And then, <laughs> these are modern Europeans, you know. And then another one who was part of the plot to kill Elizabeth the first and narrowly escaped the chopping block himself. I mean, this is amazing. And then, and then he talks about a modern European who clearly must have married a noble, maybe a uh, 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 you know like a third or fourth daughter or something, and gained control of her wealth. And did you see to 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 finance this expedition? He sold all her clothes. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. And the another and the other thing is that you're also affirming, uh, and it doesn't change and hasn't changed, is that they're they're all dealing with. Um, Charters and plantations and yeah, it's yeah, yeah. And and I was thinking that's why it's so important for us as much to understand that we are not dealing with English law when we're dealing with ourselves. That that was for them doesn't apply to us. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you know what else? Um, 
you know, because I keep telling people keep over and over and over again that um, these, 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 what we call union states or states of whatever or commonwealth, look at the Commonwealth of Virginia, the original name for that is the Virginia Company, and it hasn't changed. You, it started with the Virginia Company, the London Company, and the Plymouth Company. Today you have a location called Plymouth. Up there. I don't know. Uh, what is that? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> what is that? Is it me? I don't what know what that is. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I had unmuted a caller, and that started. I don't know what that is. They're listening to classical music while you were reading to them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I unmuted caller 503 um, 503-328 to um, join in the discussion because they press one. But then that's where the music was coming from. I'm like looking on my phone, like what? What is that? <laughs> yeah, but it's not on my phone. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, um, yeah, this 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 particular reading, and even um, you know, when I first it with um, they were white and they were slaves. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Now, what was interesting about that was this is this was 1839, and that's uh, uh, the city of Liverpool, 1839. So in 1839, this is how they were treating modern Europeans. And, and mm-hmm. when they came over to this land, it 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 didn't change. It was it was really terrible. It was absolutely terrible what what was happening to modern Europeans, <clears throat> and um, even even it sh- it even shows that um, this this type of behavior was carried over to modern Europeans. I mean, sorry to um, the, uh, the the Aboriginal Indigenous people of this land, but did you see? Did you read? Did you hear in the beginning? It said that they tried initially. They did try to enslave the Aboriginal Indigenous people that they're calling the Native Americans, but mm-hmm. it was not easy, and this is why they went back to Great Britain. And started um, moving, moving modern Europeans over to this land now. You said this is they they started moving. Uh, oh, you are you saying that the British tried to uh, enslave their own people, basically, because we're we were we're all we're all Moors, and. That yes. wasn't easy. So that's when they started bringing the modern Europeans over for the companies that they wanted to run. Yes, yes. They tried. They, it, it tells you that they, they initially they tried to enslave us to do all of this menial labor, but then it didn't work. <clears throat> what it also showed, um, because they like to depict that there was nothing going on here, but they tell you um you're, you got feedback going. Turn the phone down a little. All right. All right. Better? <clears throat> yeah. All right. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. If they tell you in this reading, it talks about how when they came over here, they saw the women with gold plates, right? Gold plates. The men, the men with rubies on their fingers, what is it, the size of a, a thumb, right? And um, building, buildings with huge columns. Did you did you hear that? <laughs> no, wait, say that again. 
in this reading, it says that when they came over here, I'm going to try to find it, but when they came over here, they found, built, they found, Emma, All right, can you there hear you me now? Yeah, oh, you would. I don't know what happened. Yeah, you'll have to repeat that. Repeat <clears throat> that again, please. Um, it said, can you hear me? Yes. All right. It said that the women were more gold breastplate. The men had ruby gems on the side of the your thumb. And the building, um, the building had two, were built with huge columns. I, you remember me reading that? I know it was kind of, it was kind of lengthy, um, but I read that. So that that right there substantiates the fact that, uh, you know, although they like to portray that when they arrived here it was barren, there was nothing here. Their own words. The own words and their own own accounts contradict that. Well, you know, yeah. Well, not only that. Like when we went to Ellis Island, the first thing they said is that true. You know, I mean, it even says contrary to, you know, what people believe that this was barren. There were over two hundred families they found, um, yeah, already here for thousands of years that that were already here. So yeah. So so what does yeah. this prove? It proves that there's a miseducation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know what? Not only is it miseducation, but it's missing information. But hold on. I have unmuted a few callers who would like to participate in this discussion. Of course, we have Brother Bukhari, Islam, and, <laughs> <laughs> Islam. and we have caller... Eight five six seven four zero. You are unmuted. Caller five zero three three two eight. You are unmuted. And caller two one four five six five. You are unmuted. To oh wait wait wait. And call two one five eight four four. You are unmuted. Now I have made a comment. Rod has made a few comments. Who would like to comment next? On what was read One at a time <laughs> Well Bakari has been commenting for uh, The past two two weeks Or three weeks yes. following up With yes. all of it <laughs> So he's just <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> yes. well, I, want, I want to ask What's that now? You're there hey. now I did, I'm not doing anything. I got my earpiece in the hole in there. Maybe I need to switch it to the other ear. <laughs> All right. So um, I am interested in what you think. This is for everyone, but for the part yourself. What do you think of the information that was presented? This is not a novel. I'm just going to let everybody know. This is an actual historical accounting of the true play from the book that we're reading, White Cargo, The Forgotten History of Britain's White Place in America. So I just want to hear your thoughts on what was read in these, you know, the, I mean, you read the first two chapters, the introduction, and you did an excerpt from the book, They Were White and They Were Slaves. So I'm going to be quiet. So we hear your thoughts and then. You know, anyone else would like to comment after? <laughs> Brother Bakari? I hear you, but we don't hear Bakari. Yes, yes. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Oh, I didn't know you were talking to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, now, were you talking about uh, this evening or the last show? No, today's broadcast. Oh, today's broadcast. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I was not able to hear all of it. Um, had a little, uh, a little, uh, probably like the first uh, forty-five minutes. I did not attend. 
I had to take care of a situation, so I was not able oh, to. Oh, that's all right. And what 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 yeah, you heard? Yeah, because I, you know, I, yeah, and so I don't want to. Um, I, I can't be specific because I, you know, I did I missed out on the first like forty five minutes or so. But I do want to listen. Overall. <laughs> The question again is not just well, yeah, just the well. You well, are what did you think of what did you think of the information that was just presented? I mean, because I mean, I hear you missed the first forty-five minutes, but I mean, once again, they outlined that we're dealing with three companies today. Everybody thinks they're dealing with government. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, I can definitely speak on that. Um you know, it's 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 well what I'd like to say first of all is thank you for um as always, thank you for allowing me to speak and um having this platform. Um you know, over the you know, over time like I've tried to establish some sort of rationale in terms of time frame. That's very important to me, um, is, is, is trying to match time frames, errors, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and it's really difficult when you don't have maps and there's so many books that have been burned and, and a lot of information that I'm sure that we don't have access to. But from what you've read and from what I can gather, you know, it's a horrible process uh, because um, it's it's one that deals with a lot of lies, a lot of misinformation, um, a lot of brutality, and it's all um, like, for instance, um, it, it, you know, it's it's all based in fraud, you know, and it's, you know, it's an ongoing. Um, process of of uh, treaties and um, <clears throat> bullets, codes, uh, things that are enacted, events, uh, treachery. You know that you know has you know started at many different points throughout history, but the fact of the matter is is that there are people here on this continent. Regardless of what their uh, culture, you know, regardless of what their religious affiliations were, I mean, like I'm looking at several maps right now with, you know, with names that I can't even pronounce. Uh, uh, one of the terms on, you know, on this particular map is called Amepica, A M E P I K A. I have no idea what that means. I don't know if that's some uh, it, it sounds like a, a derivative of America, or perhaps America is a derivative of it. And so, um, it you know, it clearly shows that there's no way, when you start looking at dates and times and all of these things that are in all these numerous books, you can't escape it. You, you cannot escape that there was uh, uh, an actual intent you know, uh, because many people like to discuss the activities of conquest in um, uh, northwestern Mexico, southwestern Mexico, and the adjoining islands in Central America, etc., as you know, like an accident. You know, like one thing happened, then another thing happened, then another thing happened. I'm, I, 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 I don't want to overly focus on this particular point, but. Um, I don't see it that way. Like, I'm sure that there are things that, you know, happen from time to time that was, you know, uh, um, emblematical of, of um, chance and, 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 and uh, happenstance, but most of it is planned. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's specific to taking control of the resources of the land, um, taking control of the people, uh, removing uh, elders um, and then, you know, instituting a situation, a, a, a heinous act where 
the where the heirs don't know who they are. Mm. Don't don't know their history. And and, 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 and so the you know the 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 main different stories that are that have been um instituted by these foreigners, um whether it was the you know transatlantic slave trade, um, you know, is a testament to that because I'm looking like I've read several books um, on this whole issue of uh, Morocco and North and and, and North America, um, and then issues ab- about treaty like the Treaty of Verona. And it's it's just all you know like the information is out there it, it, you know like you can't miss it but you know when you start reading these you know these things that aren't taught in school about treaties and about laws you know especially when you talk about North America like you can't miss the like in twelve thirteen the Treaty of Verona took place and then you go to fourteen ninety three. Now you have the Intercaterra Divina. I mean, that's that's right after 1492, and in 1492, like you had the Pontifex. I mean, so, so you know, like like these cats are planning, <laughs> you know. So, how far does this go back? You know, you know. Uh, before I uh, uh, um, excuse myself from the floor, I just want to say that. This, like if I were to put things in the, you know, to try and put this in a time frame and a perspective, let's say from 1213 to, you know, present. 12, you know, 1213 to, you know, present is a small piece of history. You know, I think that one of the biggest things that we can do when we try to relate information is focus on Dates, times, and places, and bloodlines. Um, you know, I think that that will help put things into perspective uh, because, um, you know, Moors speak quite a bit about our titles, Bay, El, Al, Day, and Ali. Well, those titles go back through millennia. You know, this is not just a contemporary thing, and the 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 bloodlines of these individuals who are currently in power on all of the major in all of the major nations are um, I'm of the mind are all related, and so um, you know this is like the. This is truly the secret. This, you know, this is the biggest secret here, and the secret is is, is, is kept or, or has been kept from the the, the modern day more, if you will. Um, and I think that uh, uh, that is the 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 big travesty here, uh, because quite often, like we get, um, like like we lose. The, the, like like we get caught up into the scope, the, the, the grand scope of these activities, of, you know, of, of them coming over here and um, doing what they did. But I think that we not only need to focus on that, as, you know, as I close, but we also need to look at, the, you know, the, the fact that they were allowed to, I won't say allowed, but because of some of our actions, from a military perspective, from, from a law perspective, uh, we allowed certain things to happen, and so we, you know, so we can't allow those things to happen again moving forward. Like we have to think about that and, and look into history, um, you know, with a very practical eye. And uh, Islam. <laughs> Islam. Um, this is this is Robin Bradley from North and Mixon. Um, Bre- Robin Bradley Bay. Um, um, please please pardon me there, because I'm I'm getting new to um my my um you know who who I am my my um 
No, my consciousness. Um, and everything that I heard, like, um, well, I didn't come in until the brother came in, like, um, like about when he did. I didn't, I didn't hear, I didn't hear a lot. Um, but I just wanted to, like, piggyback on on something that that he said, you know, in in terms of, um, you know, um, like, it's one thing that that all these things that you know. People came in and they, and they did what they did unrighteously, but that it would be more of an atrocity to to sit back and to continue to let it um, uh, continue. And so um, I've I've just found um, like every experience that I've had uh, with my new Morris brothers and sisters to be um, nothing short of the truth and just. I mean, just um, just a wealth of knowledge. Like school, school couldn't have. I don't believe any school could have ever prepared me for what I learned when, um, you know, in in the rooms with with uh, um, uh, uh, Krista Mariah, uh, uh, Rod L L D Bay, and and um, uh, when she um, Taj and and I just and, and just in, in hearing um uh um uh sister Anna L just and, and the things and, and, and Israel and seeing how young he is and how much, you know, was poured into that young man, um, from 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 his mother and and the things that I've been taught like from his mother, you know, um that that awoken things inside of me. And so um, I'm, I'm just like I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful, and I and I want to be a part of of the going forth to um, to uh, make things to make things better. To 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 definitely be about you know um, where I can you know um, teaching someone and telling someone you know what 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 I've been taught. Um, all right, all right. I thank you. I thank you. So much for that, and um, um, now did I hear you say? I, I, that you know what? I just wanted to make one comment on what she brought to the table. This is why Prophet Nubajarali said uh, that even those who have been educated, you know, they're full right on, and that's the reason he said it because she's affirming that you know the education nobody was really prepared for it. So I just wanted to. Uh, to add that as well. All right, all right. Um, I, I was. Did you say? Did, I'm not sure. Did you hear the reading that took place? No, ma'am. Or, I didn't. All I, right. I, I didn't. All I can't. Right. I was having a whole lot of trouble getting just into um, the conversation. Um, getting into the um, onto the program. All right. It just kept giving right. me a, a hard time. All right. All right. Well, let me let me just let me just. Because what what today's broadcast was entailed is I was reading from a book entitled White Cargo: The Forgotten History of Britain's Black Slaves in America. This is this is, this is documented um, documentation that was never unveiled to us. It's not a part of any curriculum at all. So what we what I did, and this is the third. The third broadcast that that did this, I read from the um, in this case this this broadcast two chapters and two excerpts. Well, two chapters, an introduction and an excerpt. It it it, it when we did a lateral move from the previous book that we were reading because this book gets into greater detail, and the listeners are to listen and then afterwards we had discussion. Mm-hmm. About what was read, but since okay. you did not hear any of what okay. was read, you mm-hmm. can't really participate in the document, sit in the discussion. However, I thank you for your comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Um, we have a few other callers. I'm. 
I'm sorry, but um, what what's the first three numbers of the number you're calling? Me. Mhm. Uh, uh, two one five, eight four eight four four. All righty, all righty, all righty. I just wanted to be. All right, because we have. Um, oh wait a minute, we got another caller. Another caller. Uh, let's see, caller five one zero three three four. You have been unmuted, but I'm not sure if caller. Let's see. Caller eight five six seven four zero. Islam. Islam. Yes, this is Nin. Um, I thought the reading was well, um, and thank you for um, the change of venue from the classes as opposed to now reading the books. Um, and uh, I just wanted to make a comment um, a little bit off of what Ross Mariah said, that um, how it changed from... They coming over here enslaved, and now it's been put on the indigenous people, the Aboriginal indigenous Moors here, conscious or unconscious, through the various uh, institutions and things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, though, that the uh, information is left out of, say, the public school systems. Most of it is... um, most history that the students get or in schools or um, universities and things like that is the education between 1774 when we the Moors lost our nationality until 1861, that time period. Um, this is completely left out. Um Somebody is making some background noise, and I'm not sure who it is. Uh, so um, let's see. We have, um, let's see, caller 510334. I'm not sure if you would like to comment. And we also see. Islam. Uh, this is Anthony Ali Shinkle Bay, Northwest of Mexico. Hey. I was actually. Uh, I was actually reading along. I have the book on uh, digital. Uh, yes. And I was reading along <laughs> with you. It, from the beginning. And very, very, very well. Well, well. I appreciate I've been listening for a long time. Um, very well. I have a coworker who's Irish, and he calls himself, of course, white. And because I'm at work, I don't like, I don't want to challenge what he says. And I remember him saying that he's had land since the 1600s here. And hearing this in the book and actually having it, it just, uh, it's mentally affirming to everything I've been exposed to. Um, And it just says that, man, hands off to... Uh, the colonists, they've completely uh, conquered us mentally, and that's all it is. It's all mental enslavement, just as our prophet told us, and uh, I'll just stop there because mm-hmm. I don't want to ramble on, but um, mm-hmm. uh, Islam and well, Brian, many things. Well, thank you so much for that. I just want to, because we got a few other people who are unmuted. So oh, five zero three three two eight. We got about uh, about fifteen more minutes before this broadcast ends. So I'm trying. I'd like to hear everyone's thoughts on what was read. Islam. And, um, Islam. Islam, this is Brother Gamboyo, Portland Territory. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed every, every bit of it. I, I, I appreciate it. And I, I say, go more, go. Keep up the good work. Well, all right. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. Uh, I wish um, we could uh, have it twice a week. 
Wow. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. Um, and if there's any recording, I would like to know about the pre-recording because I like going back and listening over and over. I, we found repetition is the mother of learning. So um, right. that's where I'm at with it. That's where I'm at. Well, this is the third Wednesday that we read. And like I said, I did a lateral move to the other book because it gives you the whole background. It gives you the foundation of how the whole slave movement started and who it started with and what their thinking was. But prior to last Wednesday and the Wednesday before that, I read um, six chapters out of Colonists for Sale by Clifford yes, Lucy Alden. Yes, so, I was listening. Yeah, so okay. Okay. <laughs> so the goal I enjoyed that also. All righty. That's wonderful. Now, next week, I don't think we will be having a reading, only because Tuesday we have Principles of Nationality in Action. Wednesday we have, we will be at, right, we will be at the National Theater for class. <clears throat> so we won't have this particular forum. And then um, I believe next Thursday, still waiting for confirmation, it's Sons of Allah. So we probably won't have another reading next week, you know, maybe we'll do uh, like an extra day the following week because third Wednesday we have, we will be, um, we have Abdullah Bay who will be doing etymology next two Wednesdays from today at the National Theater and we'll have our Tuesday broadcast. So maybe I'll think about maybe doing another reading on a special day, you know, Thursday or, you know, because we don't normally do anything on Thursday or maybe we'll just wait until the next Friday, which is the fourth Wednesday. Listen, you see what happens if, you know, if anyone is, I, I would like to hear from people regarding, you know, the, the three weeks of reading of this Well, I'm going to be... I, I do plan on yes. continuing because the goal is to read the entire book. That's Wonderful. the goal. Cool. But yeah. I would love to hear from people. So if you can send an email to mhhsiswideopen at gmail.com, let us know what you Wait thought of what we've read the past three weeks, you know, and hey, maybe maybe we'll, we'll do another, you know, an extra day. And okay. continue reading. I don't know. Okay. Make a suggestion. What's that? What? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. What is that? Uh, what is that website again? No, no. Send an email to m h h s eyes wide open at gmail dot com. Because I, I'm like I said, I would love to hear people's thoughts on what was read, and also, you know, anything else that you might want to share regarding the reading. Um, you know, do you want more of it? Was it was it informative? Did uh, you know, did it help you put some things in perspective? Because um, I tell you, uh, you know, I understand what um. Uh, Bakari is saying when he talks about the map, which is which is why you know it behooves all of us to go and look at various old maps, not the current. Yes, you know, yes, I know. Not uh, the current map. I think that's very wise. Older maps. Yes, me. And mm. also, when as I'm reading, they tell you, you know, it was called this, which is what is called this. Today, so it tells you. So you know, we should be looking at a map and like crossing off certain things that are there now and replacing it with what it was called prior to that. Um, because, like yeah. you said in this book, in this book, they chartered from Canada 
what is today called Canada, all the way down to Florida. That was charted to Great Britain, and they broke it up into three sections. Um, the the portion mm. from like North Carolina all the way down to what is called Florida, that was the, I think that was the Virginia Company. And then from North, from North, um, what is it, from North, North Carolina all the way up to, I want to say what they call New England, that was the, the London Company. And then from that all the way up through Canada, was Canada, that was called the Plymouth Company. So it was hmm. these these land masses represented three corporate sales territories hmm. today, and that was that was controlled by Great Britain. But um, you know, I tell people. Consistently, we need to go and research the um, union states where they get their charter from. Um, many of the, the municipal corporations, these county, city, town, township, boroughs, parishes, wards, all of that needs to be researched because what you're going to find is they were sales territories for Spain or Portuguese, Portugal or um, Great Britain, but you got to know which one of them, like also France, you got to know which one of them because when they talk about they got a charter to do something, the charter, if you pay attention, the charter never gave them the land. It gave them access to that sales territory. That's mm. all it did. So mm. when you go and you start reading some of these charters and they start talking about, even in this book, it said that Walter Raleigh sold his interest, his charter interest, mm. or his, he sold his charter to someone else, but he retained 20% of any profit that was made. You know, oh. so they're yes, not man. talking about a land map. They are talking about a corporation. And mm-hmm. look, they yeah. say it in this book. They tell you, tell me in this book. So today, our challenge is to exercise out of our minds the fact that these states or commonwealth, that they are government because guess what? They never started as government, and they're not government today. They are what they have always been. They are companies that have incorporated. It doesn't matter if they're incorporated or not because a company is a company is a company. And so Mm -hmm. we, we the people across the land must know is that a company can never have the power and authority to tell you what you can or what you cannot do. But now we don't need to try to eat we don't need to try to eat this particular elephant in one bite. We need to do it one bite at a time. And you know, our major challenge is travel. Traveling, right. they, we mm-hmm. are hindered mm-hmm. in our right to travel. So let's get out of the rafters of you know the the you know trying to 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 to, to, to claim land or get you know like like big things. How about we just look at trying? Uh, or how about we look at uh, accomplishing the revocation? The, the, the you know the removal of this hindrance on all people's right to travel. Based on this information alone, everybody should be clear. You're not dealing with government. Everybody should be but, clear. But unfortunately, that is so clear. true, sister. But unfortunately, a lot of people are not clear on that. Right. And we got to make it, we got to try and be the best example I think that we can be 
to try and make them clear. I'm, right now I'm working with my children. I'm trying to make it clear. <laughs> so they'll be on this line okay. next, uh, next week, next Wednesday. Oh, yeah. That's how I'm working it. So I'm working from the inside, starting with myself, out toward with, with my children and then family members and then, uh, you know, those who will listen, my neighbors, some of them. But I, I just well, think a lot for everyone. If you work on if you work on yourself, then what happens is that changes your energy and it'll affect everyone and anything around you. But you're never going to get there unless you just dedicate yourself to self. Because you can't change That's right. anybody else. You That's can't right. change anybody else. So, so, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, um, um, let's, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, what? Go ahead, brother. No, no. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, my uh, good brother. No, I just wanted. To, I just wanted to go ahead and let, let him get the opportunity. And uh, I just wanted to say, I'm just thankful that that uh, sister that the, that you more are on the line, and we're doing what we can do with the best you can do. And that's all. We as always required that we all do the best that we can. And I just say, go more is go. Keep going. Don't give up. Keep up the work. Peace. It's love. All right. It's love. Um, I just uh, 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 wanted to make a observation um, uh, about the uh, about this activity. I, I think it's a wonderful activity, and I think it's needed um, uh, because it because it allows you to do certain things. Like when you mentioned the. Uh, business aspect and the commercial activity of these individuals and how they were going to divvy up land and things of that nature. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's something. Okay, hold on. I got to edit it. Hold on. All right. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, uh, 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 that's a you know that's a great point uh, because um, uh, how it relates to okay. to this uh, information is that one of the things that I noticed is that when you look at the founding, like when they came over here and they started you know uh, uh, implementing their policy and procedure, <laughs> is essentially what they were doing. You know, with the London Company and and uh, mm-hmm. Lord Baltimore, Tom Tucker, and, and all these cats, the Duke of York. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, that 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 information is crucial in these readings uh, because it mm-hmm. it ties you into it 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 ties you into what was going on in that time frame. Because you can say, oh, okay, well, I know who the founder of the Virginia Company was in um, 1607. But what it also does for you is it makes you think about things because there's, inf- there's other information that's co-located. And this is why this practice was really enjoyable for me, uh, especially having somebody else read it uh, because of my memory issues. Um, but mm-hmm. when I look at the fact that the signers of the Declaration of Independence were still walking the land in 1607, in 1620, in 1623, in 1635, in 1653, in 1664, all the way up to 1682. These were all individuals throughout that time frame from 1607 roughly to 1682 who are individuals who signed the quote unquote Declaration of Independence. This is your first fish. I got one. Father's Day, a day to say thanks to the most important guy in the world. This year, get him what he really wants at Cabela's Father's Day sale. Don't miss our 8 a.m. doorbusters.